So this is a continuation on a, of a video series where we're actually talking about the things that influenced Darwin on his uh, evolutionary theory or the theories behind the evolutionary thought that Darwin actually had at its time. Now the next big step that we actually stop is going to talk about George Cuvier. And he was also a naturalist, an ecologist, and a geologist, which focused on paleontology or the study of fossils. And he was interested in animals, he was interested in classifying animals, and also understanding the relationship between animals and their environment, specifically as seen in rocks or fossils of life forms. And what he noticed is that there was such a thing called a fossil record, or that the fossils could be used as a timeline of the history of life on Earth. Because as you go deeper into the rock strata, new kinds of animals that don't seem to exist anymore are there. And as you go higher and higher in the rock strata, you see changes in the patterns of life. For example, uh, this is a good example right here, a gradual lineage of evolution. You notice things like that, that as you go higher and higher, the animals change over time. And that as you go throughout time, you see new kinds of animals showing up. And there some seems to be a very old earth that has gone through a lot of stages with a lot of different kinds of life forms. And George Cuvier comes with the idea of catastrophism, which is basically the idea that animals go extinct when they cannot cope with rapid environmental changes. In other words, kind of like what Thomas Malthus would, would have said in terms of economy, that populations sometimes crash when they don't have enough resources. And when catastrophes happen or big changes happen to the environment, animals will suffer and most likely sometimes not be able to survive that. So he comes up with a theory of mass extinctions or catastrophism as a result of pressure put by the environment on the animals, which makes them more, less likely to actually survive. And so in comes the idea that animals are constantly under pressure to survive. Very important for what um, Darwin is going to be talking about soon. Now then it comes Charles Liel. Now Charles Liel, along the same lines as James Hutton, studies geology and actually focus on the idea that the earth is changing. But he takes it a step further than actually Hutton did and actually talks about that earth is not only changing gradually, but that it's changing in the same way that it always changed. In other words, that the processes through, or that govern the changes of the earth are uniform throughout time. And that they're similar and predictable ways that you can actually use to time the change or the age of the earth throughout time. So at Liao's time, we're talking about an Earth that is millions of years old for by now. Scientists realize that Earth must be very incredibly old because it takes thousands of years for rocks to form. And because they figure this out by looking at the rock strata and figuring, starting to figure out things like the rock cycle and changes like erosion, deposition, lithification, uplift, exposure, weathering, and all these different kinds of processes which form rocks and break rocks and make new rocks and change rocks. He actually figured out that all of these parts of geology are actually the same they have always been. And that erosion usually takes the same amount of time. And that uh, rock formations take the same amount of time. And that volcanism takes similar amounts of time to form the land and so forth. And so in comes this picture of the earth as changing, but through a process that's predictable across time. And all of these ideas are going to be put together by Darwin to actually come up with his theory of evolution. So to review what we talk about, starting in the 1700s, Linnaeus actually started classifying animals and invented a binomial classification system so that scientists could talk to each other and classify animals based on similarities in their features. And this is in layers of complexity and groups, kind of like what um, Aristotle would ask for. And Aristotle, remember, was a, a proponent of the fixed creationism, or the idea that organisms have been always the same, and they were created the same, and it's been like that since the beginning of history of life. And then came James Hutton, a very important father of geology, which also studied paleontology and came up with the idea of gradualism, or the idea that the earth is old and changing throughout time. And then here comes the first biologist to come up with a theory of evolution or that the fact that animals actually change over time. That gradual change, just like earth changes, animal changes over time as well through the process of evolution. And this is, has something to do with inheritance of traits or traits being passed on across generation. We're talking, of course, about Lamarck. And Lamarck came up with that law of use and disuse which is the incorrect principle that 
states that traits which are useful are passed on, and the traits which are not useful are not passed on. And therefore, useful traits become more common, and traits which are not useful or not used become less common across generations. But it's not quite how it works. There is no such thing as law of use or disuse. And although he was right about saying that, in fact, the animals inherit traits, and that environment puts pressure on animals, and that it does have something to do with the animals, how they change over time, the environment, it has something to do with that. He was wrong about how it happens. It has nothing to do with use or disuse. In fact, now we know that it's necessary for things to be disadvantageous for the phenotype to actually disappear. And it's necessary for something to be advantageous for in order for it to actually become more common. And that offspring cannot inherit what is learned or achieved by the parent in response to the environment. That gene expression patterns are not passed on or imprinted into the offspring. And that even somatic mutations are not passed on to the offspring. We now know that only random mutations which happen in the gametes because of exposure to such things as radiation or chemicals or mistakes in the DNA copy process or other kinds of systemic mistakes or viral infections, anything like that will actually lead to the formation of random mutations which create random looks which then pressure from the environment creates natural selection. And we'll talk about that as we learn the modern theory of evolution in a lecture that's coming up. But that just points out that Lamarck, not knowing this mechanism for evolution, was wrong about how evolution actually happens. Then comes Malthus, an economist and ecologist that studies population changes. And he actually understands the dynamics of populations and how they grow over time or, or actually reach collapses because of things like limiting factors. And then we had, along of that, Cuvier, a paleontologist, studying the fossil record, understands the Earth is very old and that animals go extinct when they cannot cope with rapid environmental changes or catastrophes. And then comes, much later, a scientist called Liel, which comes up with the idea of uniformitarianism, which is the idea that the Earth is, has changed throughout time in similar and predictable ways that we can track across time. With all of that in his mind comes the father of evolution, Darwin, who takes a trip around the world, see these patterns of diversity, studies all these fossils, he knows about all these scientists and all these theories, and he comes up with the idea of evolution the way we think about it. Yes, like Lamarck said, populations change over time and usually takes many generations or a very long period of time to happen. But that does not happen because of, uh, of use or disuse. It is not an inheritance of acquired characteristics. It is, in fact, passed on, in fact, but based on something that he called natural selection or the process that governs evolution. Changes in the population results when natural pressure due to limited resources forces competition between organisms. And then those who are the fittest or have a better set of adaptations survive longer, reproduce more often, and have more offspring that lives to do the same become more common in the population, which in turn changes over time. That's the idea that made him one of the most far famous biologists of all time. And along with him, another scientist, which is right next to him here on the right side, is, which is Alfred Wallace, contributed to the idea of a struggle for existence. That animals compete for access to limited resources, and that difference between the animals are going to be the key in why they're going to actually be surviving. And an expansion of this thing, which is actually a vision that Alpha Wallace had, not Einstein, not Darwin, is the idea of common ancestry, or that new species must therefore come from other species, and that therefore this means that organisms all share common ancestors, and perhaps even all life on Earth came from the same original life form. And this leap in thought led to the development of the current theory of evolution and abiogenesis, or the origin of life on Earth. But what both Wallace and Darwin were missing is the understanding of how these traits are actually passed on from generation to generation, or the idea of particle inheritance. By the way, this you see here, a sketch made by Darwin, which shows the different kinds of variation in life, and he used this to explain patterns of diversity in a later book that he actually published, to actually figure out that or to show that these patterns could be explained through his theory of evolution. Very interesting. Now, what he was missing, like I said, is the idea of particle inheritance. And for this reason, he was criticized by scientists of his time.
He was also criticized by re religious people of its time and even today because his theory contradicts the creation account that most people think. But I want to point out that it doesn't contradict the creation account. Darwin himself never said anything about the fact that life was not created. All, all he said is that the life we see today was probably not created. That life changed over time and that the original life forms were not longer around. And the life forms which exist today are, are basically coming from those life forms or they share common ancestry, which may be this ancestral life on earth. He never actually made the leap. In fact, it was Wallace which made the common ancestry leap to actually say that um, all life on earth may have come from one single original life form. And then Darwin borrowed from his idea and presented it together to the scientific community to present this magistic theory of evolution. But Wallace also has the idea of struggle for existence, which Darwin coined the process of natural selection. And that's why he's more famous also, because he was the one who integrated everything together and put into a book and was the first one to present the theory. But he was very, very much criticized by the fact that he did not have a mechanism to explain how this is passed on from generation to generation. And it wasn't too much later when he understood genetics through the work of scientists like Gregory Mendel, as well as modern population genetics, or the study of how genetic inheritance patterns change populations over time. In other words, how evolution actually happens. Then we actually figured out that, that uh, Darwin was extremely right, and then everything he said is exactly on point about how life changes over time. Now, this hasn't been the end of the, the evolution. In fact, evolution has gone on to explain much of what we know about biology today. And as we, as we study inheritance and, and, and molecular biology and start comparing animals and comparing different members of the same species and comparing different species genetically and as well as physiologically, in other words, not just how they look like but, or how, what they do, but also what their genes are saying, we can actually advance the understanding of evolution beyond what Darwin could ever dream of. And we can start making connections between animals and patterns of diversity which put taxonomy to shame for the part the way Linnaeus did it. And we'll talk about that when we hit the taxonomy lecture. But the most important thing about all of this is that evolution is, the our understanding of evolution continues to change, especially after we have molecular biology and fast technology to actually analyze the genes of different animals and try to understand the connections that exist between them and, and therefore the, how they have common ancestors and the origins of life on Earth. But so the evolutionary thought has continued to progress past the time of Darwin, and we are much, much further from where Darwin would ever was. But it's important to remember that a lot of these things actually contribute to the way that Darwin used to think. And in the last video, we're going to put the, all of this together to try to reach the point where Darwin got and understand how he integrated these different theories in his uh, theory of evolution. So I'll see you guys then.